The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask was released on April 27, 2000 to Japanese markets, and later on October 27, 2000 to North American markets. This game was made for the Nintendo 64. This was Nintendo's third home console following the Super Nintendo, or Super Famicom, as it was known in Japanese markets. Recently, in February of 2015, the 3DS remake of the game was released. In this video, I will be covering the North American release on the Nintendo 64. This is the version I played for the review, but I've also played the absolute original via the Wii Virtual Console and the newer 3DS port. The 3DS port will be covered near the end of the video. There will also be timestamps in the description for each different segments of this video. I'd like to thank Mr. Wise Guy for this amazing PC port of the game. This is an amazing port and all gameplay footage gathered was recorded using this port. With all that, on to the video. You cannot talk about Majora's Mask without mentioning Ocarina of Time. Ocarina of Time was the first 3D title in the Zelda series, and it's also regarded as the greatest video game ever created. Well, the Metacritic listing has a score of 99 and it deserves it. After release of Ocarina of Time, the development team behind it wanted to make another 3D Zelda game. Shigeru Miyamoto wanted the remix dungeons, which eventually became the Master Quest, while Eiji Onuma wanted to make a whole new game. Miyamoto told him he had to make it in less than two years, so Onuma got the work. When playing the game, you can tell it was made rather quickly. Many assets were reused, but the game still functions very well, unlike some other games that were made on the time crunch. Despite only having four dungeons, compared to the nine in the game before it, not including the two mini dungeons and Ganondorf's castle, the game required the Nintendo 64 expansion pack to run. This was a memory expansion that increased the available memory for the games to pull from, as well as screen resolution. Another game that required this was Donkey Kong 64. Most of the music in the game was also brand new, besides a few themes here and there like the shop theme and a few others. Besides assets, the majority of the content in the game was new. The play area consists of several different regions. Clocktown and Termina Field, the Southern Swamp, Snowhead, Great Bay, and Iconic Canyon. Each of these areas provided many hours of gameplay. My favorite's either Iconic Valley for its general aesthetic or Great Bay for the Zora Swimming and the Zora Swimming Beaver Race minigame. Clocktown's also a great place to interact with many of the NPCs with different dialogue options depending on the day and the time of day. Yes, that's right, this is something Ocarina of Time did not do to this extent. This game is a three day cycle, with different things happening on different days and different times. My favorite being the Old Woman Robbery in North Clocktown at midnight on day one. This three day cycle was a part of the time crunch developers were on while making the game. Each area is spaced out and timed appropriately, where it takes about three days to do the non dungeon quests in the area. The dungeon will also take about 3 days depending on how well you know it. Each cycle is about 54 minutes long. When you play the song and time in reverse, you get about 3 hours a cycle. It's actually possible to beat the entire game within the 3 hours, but it's very challenging and requires you to complete dungeons out of order and skip many side quests, in some cases even entire dungeons in out of order. I haven't mentioned saving yet, but this is done by playing the song of time. In the original Japanese release, this is the only way to save. But in the North American release, they added the save feature to the owl statues in the game. A feature that, personally, I never used and I thought it was stupid. On the 3DS release, they removed the feature of saving by playing the Song of Time exclusively and made it so you can only save the saves of the owl statues. When you play the Song of Time, it takes away all non-important items like arrows, rupees, and sends you back to start the three-day cycle and clock down. A mechanic ignored mostly ignored for the most part in Ocarina of Time was the mass, and the title of the game didn't give it away. Mass play an important part in this game. There are three transformation masks and one optional endgame transformation mask. You get these masks by healing the souls of the dead. These masks let you transform into different races, this being the Deku, which you get first, the Goron, which you get second, and the Zora, which you get third. Each mask has its own abilities and weaknesses, and the dungeon in the areas where you obtain these masks requires the use of them the most. When you wear the mask, other NPCs will believe you are the mask that is who, who previously wore it. This plays in, into important parts of the story later on. The endgame mask is the fierce deity mask, and it's overpowered and, make the, and makes the final boss a complete joke. Now that the main functions are taken care of, it's time to move on to the plot. 
The plot of the game is as follows. After a grenade of time, Navi, Link's fairy, left him. This puts Link into a major depression and he's still looking for her. We find Link in the Lost Woods. These Lost Woods look more like the Beta Lost Woods from Zelda 64, where instead of rooms, it was an actual forest. Link is riding on his horse, Epona, when he's bugged by a Skull Kid wearing a, a new mask. This is, this is Majora's mask. Skull Kid steals his ocarina and his horse. Link chases him through the woods, and when he falls, and he, then he falls into a massive tree. When, and when he falls in this tree, he sees a bunch of hallucinations of mask and ocarinas and other things that's going to appear later in the game. Skull Kid's at the bottom, and he tells him that he got off his horse, and he like gave it away. Then he transforms Link into a Deku. A Deku. Uh, Skull Kid flies away, and one of his two fairies, Tattle, is separated. Um, out of desperation, she sides of Link, and they travel through the woods and go through a hallway, which has been theorized to be a portal into Termina. Uh, this hallway also looks a lot like the one hallway from the Forest Temple in Ocarina of Time. But you end up inside the clock tower, and when you try to leave, you meet the Happy Mask Salesman from Ocarina of Time. He reveals that he's been following you, and he's looking for his stolen mask. And it's the same one that Skull Kid's been wearing. So he, he cuts you a deal, where he's like, Hey, if you get this mask back, I'll turn you back into your former self. And well, a deal is a deal, so you, Link, the player, goes out, and, he's, and you gotta get this mask back. So that's your objective. Once you're out in Clock Town, this quest is fairly easy. It only took me about 15 minutes to do it all. What you need to do is you gotta get is to get the Skull Kid. But how are you gonna do that? Well, there isn't much to do because you're Deku Link. When I was when I was eight years old when I first played this, I couldn't figure it out, and it stumped me for literal months. And I just went back to Ocarina of Time. But eventually, I figured out what to do via the internet, and it was not as hard as I thought. So once you explore enough, you'll eventually find a piece of the Stray Fairy. Um, this is a mechanic that's gonna uh, come back in the game a lot, especially in the dungeon, just to pad out more time. Um, so, there is a fairy fountain in North Clock Town, and if you have the stray fairy, you can take it to her, and she will be uh, reassembled, and she'll give you magic power, so you can shoot bubbles as Deku form, as Deku Link. Once you get out of the shrine, you see a kid shooting at a balloon, which you probably already saw if you were just looking around. You can shoot this balloon, and the child will make you play a game. It's kind of like hide and seek. You find once you find these kids, all of them, they'll give you a code to the secret hideout, which is the Astral Observatory. In this observatory, you can use a telescope to get a view of Termina Field, which you can't enter yet, since the guards won't let you out, since you don't have a sword and you're a child. Um, when you look towards the clock tower, you see Skull Kid, who then looks to the moon, which is going to fall in Termina in three days. What I didn't mention yet is that since the moon will crash in Termina, this is why the time limit is here. Um, this is what's going to happen if you let it fall. <laughs> the moon will drop a meteor onto the, like, the deck area of the Astral Observatory. This is the moon's tier, and in town, a Deku merchant wants this uh, to trade for his Deku flower. I'm pretty sure he wants to give it to his wife or something. Uh, a game mechanic, now Deku flower is a game mechanic that lets you fly. Now, you have to wait until the clock tower opens for you to walk up, which just happens at midnight on the third day. So if you finish this by like 2 a.m. on day one, you got a while to wait. But luckily there are um, scarecrows that would let you speed up time. Eventually you can get up to the tower and you can shoot Skull Kid to get your ocarina back. Once you pick it up, you get a flashback from Princess Zelda where you relearn the Song of Time. By playing this, you can transport back to the start of the three-day cycle. 
You can go back to the Happy Mask Salesman where he teaches you the Song of Healing. And now this will heal you from your curse and you'll get the mask. He's also under the impression that you had his mask back and this is why he does this to begin with. He's saddened. He's saddened and he, he lashes out at length for being semi-tricked. Also, I like to add, and I noticed this as writing this, that time does not pass when inside this building. And I believe the Song of Time does, just does not affect this area. Since it'll be odd from his perspective, the Happy Mask Salesman, that no time has passed since you first left this building and now you're coming back. The Happy Mask Salesman's also extremely strange. The Happy Mask Salesman uh, also lacks transi transition animations and he's a very jerky and odd character and I do not like him. This is just the beginning of the game. I'll, I will not be given a full synopsis of details. Woodfall is the forest area of this game. It mimics meeting the Dekus first in Ocarina of Time. In this area, there's a lot of issues with the water. It's poisoned and the Deku princess is missing. The Deku king blames these monkeys for her disappearance. Kotake and Kotume are back as witches in a potion hut. One of the sisters is lost inside this game's version of the Lost Woods. You are tasked by the monkeys in these woods to save her friend, save their friend, and break into the Deku Palace. Once you eventually do, the monkey teaches you a sacred song from the Deku family. This song awakens the Woodfall Temple. One mechanic you gain access here to here is warp statues. These let you warp around Termina. Kabora Gabora, the owl, will teach you the song you use to fast travel, and it's a massive time saver and a help. With owl statues all around important places in Termina, where you need to go, you will be using this a lot. The temple of this area is Woodfall Temple. This is by far the easiest temple in the game. Its main mechanic is the Deku Flower, and it's rather short. The Stray Fairy Collection consists of 15 fairies to find in each dungeon, and when you collect them all, you can bring them to the fairy fountain near the temple in each area to reassemble the Great Fairy and unlock an optional skill. The skill for this area is a larger area for Link's spin attacks. The boss of this dungeon is Ola Dolwa. He is a tribal looking boss, and I think he's my second favorite boss in the game. He's very open about how to attack, just try anything and he'll be defeated. He's also very easy. The main item you get here is the hero's bell. Once you defeat the boss, a portal opens to a mysterious realm where you meet a giant who teaches the oath to order. This song is used in the end game to summon him and the three other giants who are freed after beating the boss of each temple. Also, each boss drops a mask. You can't wear this mask, but it lets you replay the boss battle on a different cycle, and it's very useful if you forgot to do a side quest in an area that requires a temple to be cleared. <coughs> Once you beat the temple, Woodfall returns to normal, and you'll find the Deku Princess in the basement. You'll need to put her in a bottle and deliver her to the, to the Deku Palace, where the king will release the monkey. Woodfall is saved. There's an optional side quest here, where you race a Deku butler, who gives you a mask and says you remind me of his son, who, who's lost. Now, spoiler alert, this is the dead tree you see at the beginning of the game, and it's implied that Skull Kid killed him and turned him into you. Moving on to the next area, Snowhead. Snowhead is, as mentioned earlier, and by the name, covered in snow. When you get here, you realize that snow seems worse than a typical winter. And many things and people are pretty frozen over. Hanging that something's pretty wrong here, you keep exploring and finally make it to the Goron village where you meet Kabora Gabora, again. He loses your feathers in the area that you're supposed to jump onto. And this will lead you to an area where you get the Lens of Truth, an item from Ocarina of Time, and use much less in this game. Once you leave this area, naturally the player will put them on to see what he's missed. The first thing he'll see is that the X block. The first thing he'll see is where the feathers were previously, are now ice blocks that were invisible. And it goes to go around off in the distance. Speaking to him, will have you follow him to his grave site. Once there, you play the Song of Time for him and he drops the mask. His soul is put to rest. He begs for you to save him. Eventually, you'll take his form and enter Goron Hall, where a child is crying with an extremely annoying cry. He needs a lullaby and is looking for his father. You'll find his father out on the ice between the mountain village and the Goron village. He is an old cook. An old cook? No, he's an old kook. He'll teach you the intro to the lullaby, and you're able to play this to the crying child. The child then stops crying and teaches you the rest. Then he puts himself to sleep, and every other Goron. Now that you learn this song, you can go to the temple. On the road to the Snowhead Temple, there's a massive is invisible Goron blocking the path. He's also blowing you off the path. 
You can use the lens of truth to see him and put him to sleep. This temple consists of areas that use that use the mechanics of the Goron's ability to roll. And if you were like me, spent many hours rolling across Terminal Field collecting rupees and items, stocking up before dungeons. This temple has many floors. It has a main room of branching paths. The temple also is, isn't incredibly hard. I used to think this was harder, but after playing it for the review, I found to enjoy it much more. The smooth controls of the PC port along with the 60 frames a second and HD display definitely make it easier. I was playing through the game this way, I believe that it is the hardware limitations that made it as hard as I thought it one was when I was younger. Before this, it had been a decade since I did a last full playthrough of the game, and even then it was not 100%. The item unlocked in this dungeon is the fire arrows, which are greatly or used greatly to melt ice and other ice around Termina. And later in Great Bay Temple, the next area... Oh, never mind, I read that wrong. So the fire arrows are used in this temple to melt ice and uh, all other ice around Termina, and also in Great Bay Temple. Uh, the fairy reward here is an extended magic mirror. Mirror meter. The boss of this dungeon is a uh, goat, or got, depends on how you pronounce it. I believe it's got, but others say goat, so to each their own. You chase him around a ring in Goron form. The boss isn't hard, but it's fun. Once you beat him, Snowhead will return to normal weather. And in this case, spring. Typically, after clearing the temple, each area will go through a significant change. With Woodfall being the poisonous water plaguing the area is gone, and here the central, the horrible winter plaguing the Gorons is now gone. There are several side quests you can do here, and one is mandatory. There's a massive bomb dealing Goron who will give you a powder keg to clear the rock, blocking the Goron racetrack. You can also use a swordsmith in the mountain village for a sword upgrade for 100 rupees. This one, you'll get the Razor Sword, so you can give it to him, but you also do the Goron Racetrack, which will give you gold dust. So once you go back to get your sword, he'll be like, hey, I'll upgrade your sword again for some gold dust, and he'll be like, oh, here you go, bud. And after that, you get the Goaded Sword. It has longer length, and I think it's a pretty cool design. I would not, I would never stick with the Razor Sword, since it breaks after 100 uses. If you return to the Goron who sold you the Powder Keg, you can be certified to handle Powder Kegs. The certification stays with you, even when you play the Song of Time. And there's a Goron in the bomb shop who will sell them to you. The powder kegs are required for the next area of the game and the next required character. Now, if you're not like me, you may be wondering what the hell happened to Epona. And if you did some wondering on day three of the game and you just decided, I'm going to explore, I got nothing to do, you may have discovered Romani Man Ranch, where Epona is being kept captive. Although, if you go there on day three, nothing's gonna happen and you can't get her. But, if you come back on day one with a powder keg, you'll see a massive boulder is blocking the path, and you can blow it up and get into Romani Ranch. Here we'll find Romani, who's just, um, Malin from a green of time. Um, she'll tell you that aliens invade the ranch every year and steals all the cows. She also tasks you with helping her and teaching, and she also teaches you a pony song for this quest. She also puts you through a little quick target practice for the end invasion. Now, if you're normal, you can just leave and never come back and just let her get captured by aliens. But you're not normal. You're a nice fella. So, what you do is at 2 a.m. on the first day, the aliens are going to invade the ranch. And you got to take them out. And if you play the reverse song of time, the aliens are going to move half as fast. So they're going to move double, double slow. And if you have the bunny hood on, it's even easier. Now this is, this is how I've always done the quest, I usually do it in the same cycle. I just slow time, put the bunny hood on, and make sure I have a bunch of arrows. The bunny hood's also objectively the best mask in the game, so I'm gonna like speak about that now. The bunny hood lets you move twice as fast, and in a game where time is limited, it's incredibly useful. And it's pretty easy to get as well. And you're most likely even able to get it on the first cycle as human link if you know what you're doing. Many masks in this game involve a small side quest or talking to someone at the right time. To get the bunny hood, you must talk to Guru Guru in night one or two in the laundry pool of Clocktown, where he reveals where he reveals he stole a mask from some dude. This is the Bremen mask, and it lets animals fall on you in a march. Now, if you go to Romani Ranch in the chicken coop, you find a man named Grog, who's unnamed in Ocarina of Time, and he's a depressed loser who turns into a Stalfos. During the Big Goron Sword Quest, he'll claim that his only regret in life is that he didn't see his chicks grow up in the cuckoos. So, and then if you make him all march behind you, 
they'll grow up. And he says he'll perish happily when the moon falls, and he gives you the money hood. The fact that this quest is rather easy, and how overpowered the mask is from a complete gameplay perspective, it's pretty stupid not to get the mask. Once you finish the alien invasion at around 5.15, you now have the opportunity to help Romani's sister, Kremia, deliver milk to Clock Town for the carnival. When you're a trip, of course, because something has to happen, the road is blocked by a fence, so you gotta take the more dangerous path. On this path, you're ambushed by two men wearing ninja masks. You need to shoot them with your arrows to fend them off, and once you make it out, you receive the Romani mask which lets you into the milk bar and can buy Chateau Romani, which is an applied alcoholic drink that gives you unlimited magic for all three days. Once you finish all this, there's still some more optional side quests to do, so I'll talk about these now. This mask is pretty useful later on in the game. It's making you invisible. It's an Icona Valley, and you need a lens of truth to see the man wearing it. In the 3DS copy of the game, they made the stupid decision to move him to where you need it the most, which I think is dumb, since it makes, since it makes them a lot harder to get to. But once you get it, the whole area is a cakewalk. There are heart pieces all over Termina, many of which are on screen right now. There's about 52 in the game, and it's pretty obvious since there's only four dungeons with heart containers. Many are on top of trees, and a lot of them are just in plain sight, and they're pretty hard to miss. So you're gonna, you will end up getting a few before each dungeon. Alright, now this is a real classic side quest in this game. So the toilet hand's a side quest based on a Japanese myth of having a hand reaching out of the toilet while you're sitting on it, begging for toilet paper. Like, apparently this is terrifying to some of these people. If you give him the land title deed or like a letter, he'll give you a piece of heart. It's extremely easy, it's a really easy side quest, and he can be found at 2am at the Stockpot Inn, the uh, hotel at East Clocktown. Don Jaren Mask is my least favorite side quest in this game. In Snowhead, after you bring back Spring, there'll be a frog in a small pond. I hated this side quest so much that I only gathered footage for the end of it, so you're most likely going to be seeing a loop of just them singing. And you can hear the song, I'll play it. But what you need to do is you gotta find all the frogs around Termina, including the two mini-bosses in Woodfall and Great Bay, which are the geckos. If you have to Don Jaro's mask, you can, uh, which you get by giving a, a Goron with that hat on, a rock sirloin, which you can find inside like the Goron Hall. But you can start it after this. Um, I think the side quest is stupid, but it does give you a piece of heart. In my opinion, it's best to start it after Great Bay, since Woodfall is easy and the other guys are near those areas. The Gera Mask is also required to finish the game. This mask is a reward by the Gorman Brothers in a horse race on Milk Road. This part of the game isn't particularly hard, but I failed multiple times, which you're seeing now on screen. I had to redo it a few more times, and it was not enjoyable. This mask is not my favorite to get, clearly. I didn't particularly enjoy this part of the game, but overall it's not that bad, and it did make me learn how to use Epona better, but I never used Epona since I had the Goron mask and Warplant. Now that I talked about some minor side quests in the game, uh, to get a feel like what you're going to be doing when you're not actually doing the main quest, I think it's time to get back onto the actual quests. So after Snowhead, you're tasked with going to Great Bay and, of course, the Great Bay Temple. With the name Great Bay, it seems pretty obvious that you'll be going towards an ocean. Great Bay is home to the Zora race of people. Sadly, issues also plague this region of Termina. The water temperature is far too high, causing many fish to die, and the water being very uninhabitable for many of the Zoras, and the fish who have died. Also, we find out that a Zora woman has lost her eggs due to the, the pirates plaguing the ocean. These pirates have stolen four of her eggs, and she's in a deep, dark depression. When you first enter Great Bay and see a dead and you see a dead looking Zora f like f hanging out in the water, you could swim up behind him and push him to shore, and he reveals that his name is Macau. He 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 sings to you actually that his girlfriend slash his wife Lulu is a person who's lost her eggs. And he tells you that you need to play this beautiful song, and he just dies. Um, if you play the song of healing by him, his soul will be taken to the afterlife, and he'll receive the Zora mask. So he's 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 just out of the picture now. He never really mattered to begin with. Um, there's a few other places at Great Bay when you walk right in, specifically to Spider House, which is the second Spider House in the game. 
The first one being in Woodfall, which I do not believe I talked about in the Woodfall section. Unlike Ocarina of Time, where there's a massive collectathon throughout the entire game, spanning both child and adult timelines, the Gold Skull to collectathons are isolated in two locations. Personally, I do not like these houses. For the, the first time I ever played them, they were a bit tedious, and if you didn't have the proper stuff, you, you ain't getting in there. But if you've played Ocarina of Time, which the developers intended you to do, it's pretty easy and it's a nice, and it's a nice break from the action. There's another house in the main area that is home to a fisherman who can give you a seahorse for a price, of course. Now, the price is a photograph of a female pirate, so this guy's already a perv. There's also another perv in Zora Hall, where he's like looking through uh, Lulu's keyhole. Yeah, the Great Bay has a lot of pervs in it. These people are all nuts. But, and your girlfriend, um, Lulu, is not going to be talking to you because of her stolen egg. She's in such a deep dark depression, she won't even speak. The Zora Transformation Mask may be my favorite transformation mask in the game. It greatly improves your agility and water. I think the Zora Swimming is amazing, and it's a shame that in the 3DS port they kind of removed this. It's still there, but they made like the original way cost magic energy, which is unfortunate because when a new player first tries it out, they're going to be like, oh, that uses magic, I ain't doing that. And it's even worse because there's a part in the final boss mass trading sequence crap for the fair stadium mass that requires you how to know it know it properly. And they also changed it to make it harder, which makes no damn sense. Um, using a Zora mask, you can get into the pirate's fortress, and you can get the stone mask earlier. And 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 if you get the stone mask earlier, you'll be invisible to pirates, making this game part of the game comically easy. In the footage that I'm playing now, you can just like watch me walk through the pirate's fortress, just killing pirates left and right. In the Pirate's Fortress, you need to find uh, four of Lulu's eggs, and with these eggs, you return them to the marine lab in the area of Great Bay. Also here, you can get the hookshot, which is a pretty good item for us in the game. It's also required to enter the Great Bay uh, Temple and like some parts of the next temple. Um, to get the rest of Lulu's eggs, you need the seahorse from the fisherman mentioned before. If you trade him, if you take a photograph of one of the pirates, He'll hand over the seahorse for free, and this is like the only way you can get it. So if you already in, if you already know the route, you don't need the seahorse, but it's still pretty helpful, and you can get a free piece of heart out of it. The seahorse is gonna you gotta drop it off Pinnacle Rock, and there's a bunch of eels out there, and that are these eels are also keeping Lulu's eggs captive. And once you defeated all of them, once the seahorses will find its mate, and he'll give you a piece of heart, and they'll like look they'll look around and like kiss each other. Um. This part of the game is pretty easy if you have at least four bottles to keep all the eggs in. If you don't, well, you're going to have to make multiple trips and it's not as fun. Um, once you put all these eggs into the marine research lab in Great Bay, the eggs will line up into a musical staff teaching you the new way Bossa Nova, which will grant you access to the Great Bay Temple. If you get to Lulu on the pier where she's standing and play the, and play the song, this big-ass turtle will rise out of the water and you hook shot onto the trees on its back and he'll take you to the Great Bay Temple. Um, this is the most stuff inside a Great Bay area for now. Once you finish the temple, there's like like four, like two or three more things you can do, which I'm going to talk about because it's all super, super side quests. The Great Bay Temple resembles a water filtration system and or a regulatory system. The fact that this place is acting up makes sense since um, the water is murky and it's pretty crappy for the marine life. Um, this temple isn't as infuriating as a water temple from Ocarina of Time, but it's still pretty confusing in some parts nonetheless. My biggest issue with this temple is the stray fairies. There were two stray fairies that were really giving me trouble, and the reason was just because I was acting like an idiot trying to get them. There's one stray fairy in the rafters inside this room with like two hookshot spots in different spots, and I was trying to hookshot from the wrong side for like a good 10 minutes until I actually figured out what the hell I was doing wrong. And there's also another one where it's like in between a water highway and there's a bubble so first get to pop the bubble and try to get in there perfectly but i missed it like three times so i didn't like that one either i was also on a time crunch to trying to finish this dungeon because i had to get to work so if you if you see me in the footage acting like a maniac as i play that's why um there's also a lot of parts of this dungeon that you have to freeze water currents to change a, a like a, a water wheel that would change the water current for the whole dungeon that lets you go into the it's stupid this dungeon is every water dungeon is awful um, there's one room with all these seesaws that you gotta, it's just, it's just slow. You got, you, you can walk into the room and already figure out the puzzle. It's just, it's just boring. Um, it's great that I got the magic upgrade before I went here, since I could actually use my ice arrows and fire arrows without having to find a bunch of, uh, magic, uh, pots. 
Uh, the great fairy reward here is that your health's doubled, letting you take as, twice as much damage. The main boss of this dungeon is this fish named Gyorg. He's he's a god awful boss. This is the, I had the most trouble trying to fight him. Also, the mini boss of this dungeon uh, was named Wart. He also gave me a lot of trouble. This is the one spot in the game where I almost died. Um, gecko, the gecko boss is also pretty awful. Um, there's also the spider house here, which get, can get you the adult wallet and a piece of heart, which you need the adult wallet for a mask. Um, with how much you've already played, you should have got the adult's wallet from the bank for giving him 200 rupees, but after this, there's another reward that gives you a piece of heart for only 5,000 rupees, which is awful. The biggest issue of that quest is, before the adults, when you have the adult wallet, it's it takes a while, and you don't really have time to do that, because the game is on a time crunch. I'm not dedicating a three hour playthrough to grinding rubies. That's boring. So, but once you get the adults wallet, you can get this, uh, not the adults wallet, the giants wallet, and you can get this a lot faster. <laughs> Because I, I was actually able to max out my wallet quickly and then donate to the bank without having to travel to Clocktown and other places. The bank also works pretty wildly in this game, and it takes way too long. The Angry Video Game Nerd has also mentioned this in his review, where it should have just been a simple deposit all, withdraw all, or withdraw set amount, or deposit set amount. Um, the bank, you also need to suspend logic for this bank to even work properly. The bank, te the bank teller at the beginning of the game. When you first meet him, puts a block of ink on you, and this is how he identifies you later on. To me, this makes absolutely, absolutely no sense, since either way, he wouldn't know who you are at the start of a new three-day three cycle. Or logically, he'd probably think you forged this ink spot. Clocktown's a massive town, and I had to estimate there's probably... Or, Clocktown isn't a massive town, so if I had to estimate there'd probably be about 30 people living in the town. So to me, this process of checking people's borderline stupid. I understand why it's in the game, I just think it's strange how it works. Iconic Valley is the fourth and final region within the game, and it consists of the undead, and it's a barren wasteland. You can get here by going east from Clocktown, and you also need a Pona to get here. There's a massive trading quest in this area, which I think is utterly stupid because I'm not the biggest fan of trading quests at this point. You need many items, including like five magic beans, like 20 bombs, a bunch of deco nuts, fish, milk, and some more stuff to progress through the mini dungeon here, which is actually two mini dungeons. In Iconic Valley, there's a single, more traditional looking house with Gibdos walking around it. Excuse me, there's also, sorry, it's actually it's actually raining and thundering outside, I don't know if the mic picked that up. It's, uh, we've been getting some crazy, side, side note here, just like how you need to make it rain in Icona Valley, we've been getting some pretty, some pretty wild rain, I mean, I don't think it's raining now, but we've been getting some thunder and lightning, I'm lucky the power isn't going out, we'll just lose all this recording. But, you know, actually I don't think you guys can even hear this, because I have it on, um, uh, voice isolation mode, so great, I, you guys will have no idea what's going on now. Back, back to the video here. Um, there's a there's this traditional looking house of Gibdos walking around it. There's also a graveyard you can visit where you get a mask, which is a crowd to beat the game. It lets you talk to uh, skeletons and Gibdos. In this area, you find Dampy, who's returning from Ocarina of Time, and shares his same name with the other characters. The other character of Ocarina of Time, Dampy. It's the same Dampy. Um, not a lot of characters have this perk of being the same person in every universe, so I guess he's just, he's just doomed. Dampy's always doomed to be called Dampy and, um, be some sucker in a graveyard. Um, oh, you also gotta fight this big skeleton guy, it's not even a fight, you just, like, you just gotta catch him in the gauntlet of enemies. I mean, I, that, all this footage is gonna be on screen now, you, you can tell. Depending on how, how you can pick up on my voice, you can probably tell that some of these parts are recorded out of order. I, I'm really getting sidetracked. I mean, there's not much to talk about Iconic Valley. It's a, it's a freaking barren wasteland. It's a complete barren wasteland. Like, it's so boring. I mean, it's one of my favorites, but it's really speaking about it, I, there's not much to speak about. But on the first night, if you have, there's these skeletons who are just walking around these graves. You can actually get one of them. You can get them if you're wearing this captain's hat to, to, to completely destroy the graves. And if you do it on the first night, um, it'll lead you to the com one of the composer brothers who'll teach you the song of storms. Um, as it implies, this song will make it rain. Um, and in the main village area of Icona Valley, you'll find a dried up creek that leads into a cave. So naturally, if you follow this cave, you'll meet another composer brother who will try to kill you. But then if you play the song, he'll be like, oh my goodness, my brother wrote this and he's dead. Oh no. And then he'll just make it rain and then 
the good does will go back down. But there's this sucker. There's this sucker girl outside. And so what you do, what you get into her house, this is this is this is this is a uh, classical Legend of Zelda link right here. You gotta drop a bomb outside the house. She'll come outside to investigate, and that's when you run inside, like a little weasel. And you find her weirdo father who's turned into a Gibdo, and you gotta play the song of healing and revert back to his normal form. There's also invisible ninjas in this area, which you'll need the Garrow's mask to see. Which is also a required mask for the area, which I'm pretty sure I mentioned earlier. Um, if you wear this mask, just kind of walking around Icona, there's there's gonna be these ninja suckers named the Garrow. Um, he'll gi he'll give you tips and tricks. This is exactly what I wrote in the script. The Garrow can give you tips and tricks around the area. I sound like a complete nerd, don't I? Uh, while wearing the mask, they'll just appear kind of at random. Um, they'll surround you from a ring of fire, like you know, just. I need to stop, man. I'm getting too distracted. Um, once you defeat him, the Garrow will give you a little bit of information. Every time I played, it was the exact same. Um, later in the temple, there's a high-ranking Garrow, the Garrow Master, um, who will use a bomb to unalive themselves. You know, YouTube demonetization. It's an, I don't, I'm not even monetized, but I don't want this to get shot down the algorithm. Though I've already said ass and shit like three times, so we'll see what happens. Make that four. Uh, not much is known about the girls. What the hell did I write? Not oh, not much is known about the Garrows. From what we know, they were a leading force against the Kingdom of Icona and eventually finished off the entire kingdom. Some theories say they came from Stone Tower Temple itself, with the portal that takes you to the final boss of the dungeon. Personally, I subscribe to that theory, and with that, the portal takes you to a distant part of the Hyrule. But it's all speculation. On to the bottom of the well, which is not like Ocarina of Time at all. In this bottom of the well, you go to a Tra treating sequence uh, I must have wrote treating a trading sequence as mentioned earlier if with giving those give those sorry what I did for these parts is I use dictation but I speak so fast sometimes it's just kind of hard to pick up what I'm saying on it's like it's like when I write notes in school I scribble everything so I go back to study I'm like oh I don't, I'm screwed I ain't I ain't passing this test so, the, it's a trading quest with the Gibdos, and you gotta give them stuff, like the magic beans, the bombs, the fish and stuff, but once you eventually slog through all of that, you eventually get the mirror shield, which is kinda like the mirror shield from Ocarina of Time, but you can't change it. So if you don't like the design, you're not you're not gonna be able to get it off, which is stupid. See, the, the, the mirror shield in Ocarina of Time at least look cool, this one kinda looks ugly. Um, the bottom of the well will also just put you out in the ancient castle of Icona, which isn't hard, but you do need a powder keg to finish this off, so if, you've, if you didn't realize you needed a powder keg, you go back to Clocktown and get one. Um, you're going to talk to these stupid skeletons who are always bickering, and they'll teach you the Elegy of Emptiness, which is where Ben Drown came from, the goat. Ben Drown the goat, and the Elegy of Emptiness is used to for the final dungeon. And just as a side note here, I'm, I what I do here is I write this all up. No, I still have to talk about Snowhead. So this is this is like the second to last thing I record. So you know, you guys don't need to know this, but I, I'm really breaking the immersion. You can you can tell which ones I've recorded last because I'm I'm damn near the end of I'm, I'm gonna move this one. Now. So Stone Stone Tower Temple is the last dungeon if in this game. I remember it being a lot harder than it was than my most recent playthrough of the game, which you're seeing now. But I believe that can just be summed up to me being better at video games and the graphical and performance improvements within the PC port. The main gimmick of this dungeon is being able to flip the dungeon upside down once you lock the light areas. Overall, I think this dungeon's pretty good. There's too many bosses within this dungeon. One is the Gara Master, who actually uh, bombs himself. Bomb you, Dan says Daniel Larson. The Gara Master is like Daniel Larson, but he was, if he was talking about himself. And the other is this like Nightmare Before Christmas looking boss whose name's like Gomies. Uh, both of these bosses actually did give me some trouble because I had no idea how the hell to fight them. But once I figured it out, it's pretty easy. This dungeon use, utilizes all three of the transformation masks to an extent and the Elegy of Emptiness to push down pressure plates and other boring stuff. There's not, there's not much you can even use that song for. The boss of this dungeon is Twin Mold and to fight him you're given the Giant's Mask which is like a fierce deity light essentially because you can only use it in boss in boss in this and actually you can only use it in bo this boss battle but i like the 3ds port where they nerfed it and made it crap this one's actually fun to use um 
on the 3DS port, they, they actually made Twin Mold possibly the worst boss in the entire game. So, but in the original, it's a good reward for sitting all sitting through all these terrible dungeons. Um, the reward for this area is the Great Fairy Sword. It's pretty good. It's overpowered, and yeah, I'm probably using it on screen. Unlike the other three dungeons before this, where you finish it. The area it's in has like massive change to it, and everyone's like, "Oh, we're so much happier, we're so much better." There's literally, there's literally no change in Icona Valley. It's it's the exact same, it, and it's still like some dead piece of crap wasteland. I would be pretty stupid not to mention the infamous and long trading side quest from this game to get like two of the last masks. This is the Anju and Cafe quest. This is, this one's world known famous. In Clocktown, the owner of the stock I'm gonna speed run it. In Clocktown, the owner of the stock brought in who is Anju is looking for her fiance who has disappeared. Her fiance is also the son of the mayor. If you were to go to the mayor's office, talk to the mayor's wife, you can get Cafe's mask on day one. If you were to get this mask, you're tasked with talking to people around Clocktown to see if they've seen him all day. It, they, they've seen him and see if they say the usual. Uh I'm not speed running this. They'll say so. What's going to happen is, if you go to, if you happen to talk to the mayor's wife on any day in the morning, you're going to get a mask of her missing son, and she tells you to go walk around Clocktown and ask about him. And if you do, they're going to be like, oh yeah, he's getting married, he's getting married on the day of the carnival. But if you talk to Andrew, she's like, oh, I know him. And if you were inside the stockpot in around 2 on the first day, and you can see this interaction between her and the postman, and who will also come up later in the side quest. And Andrew's given a letter from the postman from Cafe. She tells you to meet her inside the kitchen at midnight. And so she'll tell you what's going on and see if you can deliver a letter down, because she's too scared to do it herself. And I don't know why, I mean, the uh, mailbox is right outside. I don't know why she can't just walk it over there. God forbid, maybe the, maybe the hotel will get robbed or something, I don't know. Now, um, you gotta put it, you have to put it into the mailbox by 9 o'clock. But if now, if you had a keen eye, you may have noticed that there's a man with purple hair, very similar to the cafe mask with a Keaton mask on. So if you were to follow him, like on day one, you first see him, he goes into the laundry pool and hides behind the curiosity shop. And if you wait, so after this letter, if you wait outside that area till about 3.30 on the second day, you will see him receive the letter and he'll leave his door unlocked because he's an idiot. And you can go inside and wait inside his house. Once he was there, once once he's in there, he'll be like, "Oh yeah, green hat, green clothes. You must be the one Andrew wrote about." Surprised he read that entire letter so quick, but I guess he's pretty quick. And he will then reveal himself to be Cafe, and he's all, and he also revealed that he was turned into a child by the Skull Kid, and he also gives you dependent memories to go back to Andrew. Now, if you also talk to Cafe again, he'll be like, "I'm looking for the thief that stole my sun mask." So. You give Cafe the pendant of memories, and around like 1 o'clock the next day, if you go back, uh, the owner of the curiosity shop will be like, yeah, he's gone, he is, he's he's running after the thief, uh, Sacron, I think that's the guy's name, and he has a hideout in Akana Valley. Now, if you wait there, you can actually see him enter, and if you're wearing a stone mask, you can just follow right behind him, and he will not care. But you go in, and you find the sun mask, and Cafe is so eager and so idiotic he steps on a pressure plate which is already like sticking like a f 10 feet out of the ground so i don't know how he saw this after this you need to do like a little like a little um like a little gauntlet of enemies and puzzles to get this mask and it's extremely easy um but you'll eventually cafe will eventually get the mask back and he'll he'll head back to clock down now he also give you a letter to give to his mother and there's two things you can do now i mean you could give it to the postman to deliver it, who's like crying inside his place. Or you can give it straight to her, she's in the milk bar. If you give it straight to Cafe's mom, you get a bottle. If you give it to the postman, you get a postman's hat. Which is more useful at this point in the game, since I see no point to having like five bottles. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, If you go into the staff room of the stockpot inn, and there's about a minute 30 left on the clock, you'll be able you'll be able to get the couple's mask, and these, these two will be reunited, and they can die in peace together. I remember this quest being a lot harder than it was on this one previous playthroughs, probably because now I know exactly what's going on. 
and I didn't really have to worry. It was actually really easy. It was just long. It was very tedious and long. I mean, it's still a fun quest. I mean, from a stylistic and story point of view, it's pretty sweet and it reminds you that no matter what you do, you can't help everybody. Um, and just because you help these two, that means there's still a lot of people that you couldn't help. Like, for example, Romani's Ranch. I mean, you could, but really you didn't. I know for a fact you didn't. You also can't save, like, anybody else. Like, any of the f four other tribes. So, it's just a little reminder that no matter what you do, you can't save everybody. And some people will always have to suffer no matter what you do. Just a nice little reminder from Nintendo. But, after all that, I think it's now time to get go to the next area. The final zone. So once you've gathered all the remains of the bosses, so now all the giants are free. So now all you have to do for the end game part of this is you gotta go back up to the clock. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck, man? Get your ass on, man. Clock tower and meet Skull Kid like you did on the first cycle. But this time you gotta play that song that the first giant told you about. And once you do this, all the giants will come out of their homelands, and they'll uh, they'll keep the moon from falling. And then Skull Kid's seemingly defeated, but well, he's not, because the the mask, Majora's mask, will fly off him. He'll insult you a few times, and he'll rise straight into the moon after, um, you know, he'll just rise into the moon. And the only natural thing to do after that is uh, follow him into the moon. Now, inside, now, if you were expecting the inside of the moon to be like a big rocky moon type thing like some star wars ass type area it's not it's a giant vast green oasis with a big tree there's a big tree in the middle and there's also a nice motion blur effect which i think really adds to the scene if you go up to the tree there'll be five children and masks running around playing games it's not said but it's pretty implied that they're the happy mask salesman then you can kind of tell because they they got the the same hair and they even call you a happy mask salesman like, you want to be a mask salesman? Something like that. I mean, you, you guys have seen this in the footage. You can talk to these kids, and you can trade your masks with them. And you can do their challenge, which is hide and seek. And you do it for a little gauntlet of things and obstacles to get to them. And once you beat all them, um, we don't beat them. You just give your masks to them, and they'll disappear. But at, at the end of all that, you will be completely out of masks, except for your transformation mask. And uh, each of these kids disappear when you're done dealing with them. Um, there is one child sitting alone under the tree, which is actually the wear the one who's wearing Majora's mask. And if you speak to him with no mask, he'll take pity on you and give you a mask out of pity. Now this is the fierce deity mask, which is completely overpowered, and it's a great reward to beat the game in three seconds with this amazing mask. Now that you're inside the final battle chamber in this game, the remains of the temple bosses you fought will fly out of you onto the walls, and Majora's mask will come alive. So there's three stages of this boss. Majora's Mask is the first, the second being Majora's Incarnation, which is like this Michael Jackson type character. And Majora's Wrath, which is supposed to be the hardest part of this battle. Now if you did get the Fierce Deity Mask, this boss battle is a complete joke. And the reason it took me so long was one, because I needed to gather footage for this fight. And I wanted to see Majora's Incarnation do moonwalking, which I remember happening, but I couldn't get it to happen, so I guess it's a Mandela effect. But that's besides the point. The, the Fierce Deities mask is really nice. Um, it's just it's just really easy. I mean, it's it's similar to like how in the Twin Mold battle you can just let loose and the game can wrap itself up pretty quick. After you fight Majora, everything will go back to normal, and you'll meet Skull Kid in Termina Field, and he'll apologize for what happened. Then he'll also mention that you smell very similar to the kid that taught him. Oh, bro. Oh, hell. I'm sorry, a song in the in the woods. Which is pretty much a confirmation that this is the same Skull Kid from Ocarina of Time. The Happy Mask Salesman is also here. He's just staring at Majora's Mask like some creep. And he mentions, oh, the evil spirits have left the mask. And he'll thank you for what you did. And he'll just walk off in the distance and fade away. And many people try to claim that he's some like spiritual entity because he faded away. But, you know, this is pretty common in the Zelda games. Um, even in Ocarina of Time, Saria fades in. Now, I get that she was a sage, but still. I mean, it, 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 this is the game. The, the Nintendo 64 wasn't the uh, most powerful system on the planet, so I think it was a uh, limitation on the software there. But it is what it is. Um, but I have no doubt that there was some artistic um, intention there, or symbolism, whatever. Um, 
Also, if in the credits, um, I told I was YouTube Shorts taught me this. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but if you have all the masks, um, and depending on what mask you get, the ending will be different. It would show if you have like the captain's hat, it will show a clip about the Captain Kita, stuff like that. If you have the, the bunny hood, it will show you stuff about um, Krog's uh, chickens growing up. Now, I would like to say I've not actually tested this. Um, this is, I did get this off YouTube Shorts, so don't flip out if I got this wrong. Don't freak out in the comments like, oh my goodness, you piece of shit. You got my favorite video game wrong. Like, come on, fellas. Um, it, doesn't, it really doesn't matter. This video game was released 24 years ago. Link also just rides off in this scene. I'm assuming he goes back to Hyrule to become the Hero Shade, as in Twilight Princess. But at the very end, it, it's still a shot of it. At the end, there's a shot of a tree stump with Link and a skull kid etched into it. And I feel like it's a very nice ending to the hero time. What's up, Skibbities? We got some new footage here. This is this is my redo of the um, Fierce 80 mask, because I didn't feel like actually finding new footage for this, so I'm just going to, like, commentate this. This is live Fierce 80 talk right now. Um... I may just keep this as its own part because it's going to be long enough. So I'd like to talk about the Fierce Deity Mask because how nice it is. This is this is the most this is the most realist part of this game we're going to get. This is live reactions. Um, I, I, the dogs may be barking. I don't know. Someone's working on like the roof next, like in the, across the street, and the dogs seen it for the window. They're going they're going crazy. So I'm going to be talking about the Fierce Deity Mask and how much I love it. It's a nice fun mask. I guess I'll just add this into the footage like as is i don't know what i'm going to do with this i don't even know if i'll include this so if you're seeing this can this guy made the cut so i'm only going to be showing off the first boss of the fair stadium mask i mean i also haven't like played much of the fair stadium mask I don't, I don't usually use this that much so and i can't use the button because this port so the port added um um I, what button I, ooh, I just added that to a random button um this is the only issue I have with this entire port, so we're gonna we're gonna give it to that that button. I don't uh, accept. No. Oh my goodness, I'm losing my mind. Okay. Um, what what, what button did I just put this to? Okay. Okay, we got it. Um, so here's the fair Sadie mask. Can I even do spin attacks? No. Okay. Okay. I'm I'm currently getting my ass beat here. Um. And well, I don't know why it's not doing magical beams. I probably need. Oh, okay. There we go. And and he's done. This is why the fair Sadie mask is awesome. And get your stuff done like this. Real nice. Um. Hopefully I can stay inside the boss room with this on so I can, like, experiment with this. Okay, so don't hit the sword beams when you're like that, and there's there's no nice spin attack. The spin attack's kind of slow. I mean, the sword's nice, double helix, I mean. Can I pick up bombs with this? I can still pick up bombs. I don't think I can use, yeah, every single item's blocked out. I mean, do I have an ocarina? No, I don't, so I guess I'll just... That's really all I can say about the fierce. It's a nice mask. This is, like, the nice endgame mask. I mean, the design is nice, let's be real here. Can I, like, zoom in on myself? Can I put away? Can I put my sword away? No, I can't put it away. So, as you see here, it's just the model of Adult Link with, like, some cool runic stuff on it. I mean, he's nice. He's a cool-looking guy. I mean, this, I mean, I'm really, I'm really going on a whim here. This is very unscripted, as you can tell. Um, I do, like, this is actually, what I'm doing now is you cannot do this in the original. Mr. Wise Guy actually added this to the game. Um... This what I'm doing right now. Um, anal the, we're using the other analog stick. It's very nice. It also it also kind of has a glide. If you do it for a while, it has like it keeps like if you do it sometimes it keeps like a little glide to it. I don't even know. It's nice. I mean, here's the block. Can I? I don't think you can even get down. But there's a mask. I mean, this nothing beats this mask though. So that's all I can really say about this part. And I guess this is gonna go into the footage like as is. So. Hope you guys enjoy that part. So my final thoughts on the game is, you know, I really do like this game. And it, it really, in my opinion, it ex extends how great Ocarina of Time was. But it's also amazing as a standalone. Despite this game being, the despite this game being made on such tight, tight circumstances. And um, a lot of time crunches, it still holds up very well, even about 24 years later. And it's surprisingly still extremely good. And there's a lot of ease of play now to PC port. And even if you have the Nintendo Switch, um, or Switch Online, however they do it now, uh, with their virtual console, I don't got a Switch, so I don't know how it works. I did hear the emulation kind of sucks, but that was three years ago, and I heard it's a lot better now. 
So if you want to play that way, play it any way you want. If you want to do 3DS, why do it that way? But you've heard everything. This game's amazing. I would definitely check it out if I were you. The 3DS port's the biggest turd ever grace this game, and it's an awful port overall. I'm not going to go much into it, but YouTuber Narrow has made an amazing video highlighting why this port sucks. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to link it in the description because this video is probably already pretty long. And I've been writing for like a day now, so I'll link down in the description. And I'll put, I'll put the thumbnail on screen since it's so iconic. But what it did is it just took out all the stuff that made it unique. And it crapped all over what made this game cool to begin with. And I, I mean, if, if you just want to play it for the lore or something, or like clout, I don't know, you could play it for that way. But the PC port's also free, so, and it's better. But if you really just want to know about it, just read Hyrule Story or something, I don't know. Don't play this shitty-ass port. Sorry for my language. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of mad about this port. It kind of sucks. It, it's, a, it's a real letdown. It's a real disappointment. But I'll link the video from Nero. I mean, he can, he can do, he'll do a lot better job at talking about it than I will. <laughs> That's the best way I can put it. Alright, so what you're hearing right now... Um, is, uh, this is, I'm, I'm at the tail end of editing this video. I'm in between segmenting it all up and then putting it together for Final Cut. So, currently I'm on, this, this would be audio segment 21.4, maybe. So, I guess I forgot to record it after a bit. I mean, it, I mean, it's given now. I'll probably forget something. I mean, I forget shit all the time. But... I would like to say thank you for sitting through this entire video. This this has taken probably like almost a month now. Ever whenever the PC port was released, add four days into uh, June tenth. That's that's how many days it was. But I mean, <coughs> sorry, I'm not feeling too good. I had a good time making this video. I'm probably gonna do Mario 64 next. I did do a community post. Which I knew would get no votes, so I will be doing Mario 64 next. So I'm, I'm itching my leg right now, it's just something I do when I start talking. But, I mean, i like to thank you guys for sitting through this entire video. Um, if you liked it, subscribe. Um, I, I mean, I'd probably pump one of these out per month. I, I really, I'm really just doing this for fun, I kind of enjoy doing this, sitting down playing some games from my childhood and talking about them or something. Uh, that's about it. Um, like the video, comment or something, get this in the algorithm, I guess, I don't know. And I will see you guys ne next month when I do Mario 64.